Hello again. I ended the last video with this, and all we are doing here is using our definition or meaning of temperature. So, we know from the fact that when A and B are put in contact, there's no change, that that means they're in thermal equilibrium, or in other words, the temperature of A is equal to the temperature of B. And if A warms up and C cools down when they're put in contact, then A must be cooler than C, or TA is less than TC. And TA and TB are the same, so TB must also be less than TC. And so, when we put B and C in contact, B must get warmer and C gets cooler. Now hopefully you see why I say that the floor and the carpet should be at the same temperature. Assuming this carpet has been sitting on the floor for a long time, they will have come to thermal equilibrium, or in other words, they must be at the same temperature. Even if they started off at different temperatures, they will have eventually reached the same temperature. The remaining question in your mind might be why it is then that the one foot feels warmer than the other. That is a question I'm going to just ask you to hang on to, because it'll be a while before we can explain it. Let's now get into a bit more detail with thermal energy. You know the basic idea. Thermal energy is kinetic energy at the microscopic scale. But it might not be clear to you at this stage why that's different from kinetic energy at the macroscopic scale. So let's think about two cases, one and two. In case one, all of the air molecules are going in different directions at different speeds, whereas in case two, they're all moving with the same velocity. And let's further say that the total kinetic energy of both of these is exactly the same, where what I mean here is we're adding up the kinetic energies of all the molecules. So this is really molecular scale kinetic energy I'm talking about. And let's now imagine we put both of them in contact with something like carts, with sails. Well, in case two, that air is rapidly going to transfer some of its kinetic energy to the cart until the cart is moving along at roughly the same speed as the air. But in case one, the sail is going to get buffeted back and forth by collisions with air molecules from both sides. If the cart had very, very low friction, and we could measure its position extremely precisely, we might be able to see it wiggle back and forth a bit. But by and large, we're just not going to see it move. And this is the fundamental difference. Kinetic energy at the macro scale, in other words, everything moving coherently, can easily be transferred to other macroscopic objects. But kinetic energy at the microscopic scale, in other words, incoherent motion of the molecules, can't be easily shared with other things at the macroscopic scale. Let's now look at how we measure thermal energies. And to do that, we're going to look at an important experiment that was carried out in the 19th century. In this experiment, Joule set up a container filled with liquid. In fact, he used water. And inside it were paddles connected to a shaft, which connected to, through a string over a pulley to a mass. And as gravity pulled the mass down, it would make the paddles rotate. So viscous drag forces acting on the paddles work much like friction and produce thermal energy. And so this is a device that converts gravitational potential energy into thermal energy. Now, that's our modern understanding of it. In fact, what Joule was doing here was showing that work can be used to increase the temperature of an object, and this meant temperature had to be a measure of some sort of energy, what we now call thermal energy. And what he observed was that there was a linear relationship between the energy input to the liquid and the temperature of the liquid. Now what Joule was doing in this experiment was establishing that there's such a thing as thermal energy, and that it's just another form of energy just like gravitational potential energy or kinetic energy. But we would do this experiment today to measure something else. To do this measurement, first of all, we would tend to flip the graph. And second of all, in the modern experiment, we probably wouldn't use a descending mass because we can make electrical measurements more easily, and so we would use an electrical setup where we run current through a resistor that produces thermal energy, which is given to the liquid. But other than that, it's basically the same experiment. And now the thing we actually measure is the slope of this line. The meaning of that slope is something that we call the heat capacity of the liquid. 
So it is de defined as the slope of a thermal energy versus temperature graph. The heat capacity has a rather straightforward interpretation. It tells you how much energy you need to put into the object in order to raise its temperature by one degree Kelvin. Looking at units, you should be able to see that the units of a heat capacity are joules per Kelvin, where I assume that from chemistry or elsewhere you know how a Kelvin is defined. These units are going to be important to us in a moment. Now, a lot of the time, what we're interested in is not the heat capacity of some particular object, but rather a material property called the specific heat capacity. And this is something that gets tabulated. Let me explain what it is. Hopefully, it makes sense to you that a small object may take a small amount of energy to raise its temperature by one degree but a much larger object is going to take more energy to raise its temperature by one degree. And so in particular, heat capacity should be proportional to mass. So we can define what's called a specific heat capacity, lowercase c, and yes, I know a lowercase c looks, looks a lot like an uppercase c, don't blame me but the specific heat capacity would be the heat capacity divided by mass. And note that that then has units of, say, joule per kilogram Kelvin, although very often these get tabulated in joules per gram Kelvin. But we could also define what's called a molar specific heat capacity. In other words, the heat capacity divided by the number of moles. And this will have units of joules per mole Kelvin. And frequently people will define a volumetric specific heat capacity, the heat capacity divided by volume, which could be in joules per cubic meter Kelvin, although, again, this is more often tabulated in joules per centimeter cubed Kelvin. And people are often not careful about different symbols for these, and they'll just call them all a lowercase c. And so then you have to get from the context or from the units what version of the specific heat capacity they mean. I will just mention one more detail, and that's that if you think about, say, a rigid box full of gas, then it's going to take some particular amount of thermal energy to raise its temperature by one degree. But if instead you have the same volume of gas in a balloon, so that as you put thermal energy in and the balloon warms up, it expands, then you're going to find that it's a different amount of energy that needs to be added to raise the temperature by one degree. And so there are actually two distinct specific heat capacities. This one would be called the constant volume specific heat capacity, and this one would be called the constant pressure specific heat capacity. And often you'll see both tabulated. Let's check that you're understanding these ideas. So I haven't given you an equation that you can use to do this calculation I'm about to ask you to do, but you should just be able to do unit analysis to figure out how to work this out. So let's find out how much energy is required to raise the temperature of 100 grams of copper by 5 Kelvin. And I've given you a bunch of numbers here, and depending on which way you do it, some of these may be useful and others might not. Now note, I'm going to tend to specify whether I'm talking about molar specific heat capacities and volumetric specific heat capacities. The subscript P's are just telling you that these are constant pressure heat capacities, but you don't really need to worry about that. I just want you to get used to seeing these subscripts on specific heat capacities. So, have a go at this calculation. It's really just a unit analysis issue.